Please give a warm Georgia Tech welcome to our guest today, Mr. J. Paul Raines. Thank you. Um, I'm going to talk to you about three different things today. The first is I'm going to tell you a little bit about my background. I think that uh, to the degree that I can share it with you, uh, I think you'll understand that all of us have a journey that's filled with all kinds of twists and turns, and none of us really land in a situation that is ideal. So I'm going to share a little bit about my background with you, and maybe you can understand some of the point of view that comes with that. I'm going to talk to you about GameStop, and as I thought about the different presentations we do and what I could talk to you about, I thought that maybe we should share the digital transformation and digital strategy that GameStop is on. For a room full of technologists, I thought that would be the most appropriate. And then third, I'll share with you some career advice, wisdom, tips I've learned along the way that maybe can help you. So let's get started. Uh, let's see, there it is. My background, anybody know what flag that is? Bososteco. Eso, sapricista. Mm. We're uh, Costa Ricans, had to identify which soccer team he's from. Uh, it's okay though, we'll talk later. I, uh, that's the flag of Costa Rica. I was born in Costa Rica. Uh, my mother is Costa Rican. My maternal last name is La Guardia. My father was a 26 year U.S. Navy chief who traveled the world and married a woman in Costa Rica. So I spent a lot of time growing up in Costa Rica. Um, you know, I have a lot of family there. A lot of my worldview has been shaped by that time, and so you'll hear me talk some about that. Pura vida means pure life would be a literal translation. In Costa Rica, that's synonymous for all good, no problems, no worries, etc. cetera. So uh, the second point I would make is that I learned a lot of lessons in Barrio Cordoba. You're from San Jose? Yes. Curry. Bueno, somos vecinos. So I spent a lot of time growing up in Barrio Cordoba. I learned a lot of lessons there. Uh, a lot of lessons about the human condition, about the importance of education, dignity, work, etc. So you'll hear me talk about those a little bit. Um, I spent a lot of time at Georgia Tech, and uh, as I've said before, I'm absolutely unbiased and, uh, and uh, determined to continue to point out the importance of a Georgia Tech education to all of you, uh, to young people, and to my own children, as I, as I can get away with. Uh, the next item is uh, consulting years. I was in management consulting for 10 years. I was a principal with the firm Kurt Salmon Associates. Uh, I would say the single most important transformational piece of my career was the 10 years spent in KSA. I worked in dozens of countries, started up factories around the world, spent a lot of time with different kinds of clients, and it was a very rich experience at KSA. And I know that KSA still recruits here, which is great. A lot of tech people go to KSA which is also a, a great thing. So spent a lot of times there, a lot of time there. I was a merchandising leader for L.L. Bean. I ran all of L.L. Bean's international sourcing. Um, anyone here from Maine? Any Mainers here? L.L. Bean is an institution in that part of the world in New England, and I lived up in Maine. Um, started an office for L.L. Bean in Hong Kong as well as in Costa Rica through the years. So had a lot of time spent with that organization. I also spent close to 10 years at the Home Depot. I uh, started with the Home Depot in Chile and Argentina in a startup, spent a lot of time in their Mexico startup, worked in Atlanta, ran the Florida business, and my last job there was uh, Executive VP of U.S. Operations. So I'm very close to that organization. Uh, a lot of Georgia Tech people at the Home Depot, that company is a real leader in hiring people from here, and, and so it's a great organization. And then lastly, three and a half years ago, I joined GameStop Corporation as the Chief Operating Officer and was promoted to chief executive in uh, the June of 2010. So I uh, have spent a fair amount of time in different areas, you know, and, and have seen manufacturing, supply chain, information technology, uh, have worked overseas quite a bit, a lot of Latin America, some in Europe, some in Asia. And, uh, and my perspective is that um, the preparation you are gaining and the time you're spending here is the single most important foundational piece of what you will do in your career. So as, as we go through some of the things we're going to talk about, I want you to understand that I believe the time right now is the most valuable time you have to prepare you for a career that's coming. And you're going to hear me later say that luck is when preparation meets opportunity. And so right now, the time you're in right now is the time for preparation. And I can't urge you uh, enough to take advantage and full advantage of the programs that you have available here. But we'll talk more about your careers a little further on. Let's get into the GameStop story. I do want to share with you, I think it's my responsibility as the chief executive of the company to try to build fans for the company everywhere I go. So let me tell you about GameStop. GameStop is the world's largest um, 
video game hardware and software retailer. We like to say, well, we're definitely the market share leader uh, all around the world. In fact, uh, we operate in 17 countries, and we're the market share leader in 13, maybe 14 of those, depending on how you measure it. We compete every day with the largest retailers on the planet, the largest, most powerful retailers on the planet. Um, one of our main competitors is also run by a tech IE, who's also from Fayetteville, Georgia, where he went to high school, Mike Duke. So we, we compete with people who are very large and very well capitalized, and we're very pleased and proud to say that we're the market share leader. But we have a different slice on retailing. We like to say we're a neighborhood retailer. We want to reflect your community. Even though we have 6,500 plus stores, we're trying to be a part of your community. So you'll see that at Tech Square, we'll do things that are unique, that are unusual. Our managers are trying very hard to be part of this campus, part of the life. We take the buzz card, et cetera. 10-year financial sales growth, we have a CAGR of 16.5%. Um, you will see that the gaming category slowed some in growth starting in about 2008, which reflects the overlap of all the Wii and music growth that went on. We are in what's called the tail end of the console cycle. If there's any gamers out there, you know that the PS3 and the Xbox and the Wii are sort of at the end of their innovation cycle. As in all other types of technology, there are these S-curves that happen and growth will slow towards the end of a console cycle, but profitability may be ahead of the top line growth. And then you'll get another console and it'll move on, but pretty healthy growth. We have brick and mortar stores around the world. We're in 17 countries, as I said. Um, you know, GameStop's an interesting place. Video gaming, I like to say, is cool around the world. No matter where you go, video gaming is cool. I just got back from Australia and we had a manager's meeting. We have over 400 stores in Australia with over 40% market share. We invited customers for the first time ever to our manager meeting, and we had, we had to close the doors. We sold 15,000 tickets to people who wanted to come to the GameStop video game show. So gaming is cool and innovative around the world, and we're pleased that our model is well-received around the world. We've launched a loyalty program we call Power Up Rewards. Some of you may be members. Uh, if you're not, please go to the GameStop. It's free. You can become a Power Up Rewards member. But Power Up Rewards is, I would say, the most innovative, exciting retail membership program that's out there today. It has two levels, a free and a paid level. The free level gains you a series of benefits within GameStop, the most important of those being an online game library that we host on your behalf at PowerUpRewards.com and a series of benefits that you'll receive through email and interactive uh, messaging. The paid benefits, the paid level gets you that plus some discounts plus a paper or digital magazine that is one of the largest magazines in the country. The program is what I think is the model for the future, where you engage consumers on multiple levels with hybrid touch points, in store, on their phone, on their tablet, on their PC, and on their console. And our view is that consumers are gaming on multiple platforms in multiple ways at multiple times, and we need to make sure that they are comfortable with being part of that GameStop ecosystem in all of those. And Power Up Rewards is a big part of it. 13 million members added in a year, growing to 15 million by the end of the year. There's some data, power up members spend more than the average member. We believe with our model uh, that the members of power up represent over 30% of all video game consumption in the United States. So we think that we have something that's really meaningful to the consumer. GameStop has created, you'll hear us talk about a hybrid model. Uh, I was asked earlier, I had a session with uh, some students prior to this, and I was asked earlier, well, aren't you going to be like Blockbuster? Aren't you going to be like uh, some of these brick and mortar people? And I think that's an interesting question. The world of retail is migrating to what we believe is a hybrid model. You know, a lot of people want to make consumers binary. They're either physical or they're all digital, and there's no, there's no space in between. But what's really happening is if you understand consumers, consumers are doing hybrid behavior, hybrid shopping. They're shopping in stores. They're using their phone apps, right? They may be doing some mobile websites. They're also going to online platforms. They also may be buying through the cloud. So consumers exhibit hybrid behavior, and we've created a hybrid model. And if you look at this, we have a website. We have stores. We have a website. We sell digital content in stores. I'm going to show you some data. We're selling hundreds of millions of dollars of digital content in our stores. We bought an Impulse uh, download company. We're offering PC downloads to consumers at GameStop.com. We now have a streaming service that's in a private beta that'll be live, and I'll show you a little bit of what that might look like come January of 2012. We own a casual gaming portal called congregate.com. We have a relationship with IGN for content and exclusive gameplay features. 
And we're on Facebook, which everybody wants to know about. We're the number one rated store on Facebook with over 2.7 million uh, relationships with an extended audience of over 17 million. And of course, all of it is tied together with Power Up Rewards. Power Up Rewards allows you to track and earn credit with GameStop and have a relationship on multiple devices and in multiple ways. DLC. DLC is what we call downloadable content or digital content. And let's see a show of hands. How many people here played Call of Duty in the last year? Any Call of Duty players? All right. So my Call of Duty people know that there were map packs that came out from Activision, right? You guys, $14.99, the Resurrection map pack, all of those. Those were digital content pieces that were created by GameStop and Activision and Microsoft to extend the gameplay of Call of Duty. So you had the physical game, physical games in your console, but when you got done with that, you wanted more gameplay, so Activision created some cool new levels, right? Uh, my favorite on Black Ops was that uh, was the golf course level, where you were fighting a battle inside an old golf course in Cuba. That digital content doesn't come on a physical disc. It's a smaller file, two to 300 megabytes, and we sell it at GameStop, and we launch it just like a game. If anybody played Gears of War, you know, we launched Gears of War with a season pass. This is L.A. Noire, which is a cool game that we launched last year with a season pass. But digital content sold in store will be a bigger and bigger part of the future. We forecast that that business is going to grow on a very aggressive rate, well into the double digits in the future. And the physical game now becomes like a thin client that resides on your console that facilitates your gameplay with incremental digital content. We have a PC app store that I told you about. We acquired a company called um, ImpulseDriven.com which is arguably the number two or three player in the PC download space, competing with the market share leader is a company called Steam. Um, we now offer PC downloads on GameStop.com. Our goal is not to substitute or replace the Steam client. Our goal is to offer consumers who love GameStop, who want to stay in the GameStop ecosystem, a way to download PC games. And our growth is very strong, and we're offering all kinds of PC games on the PC platform. GameStop in the cloud. We've acquired a cloud gaming company called Spawn Labs. Spawn Labs is based in Austin, Texas. We acquired it last year, and we announced it in January. And we've been building out a private beta that has been running in our Dallas uh, organization for about, we've had 200 people playing it for about, I'd say now, four months. And it's an interesting technology, because what it does is it allows for porting any PS3 or Xbox game through a console virtualization technology that streams through the public internet and gets decoded with a client that is a proprietary client for ours that then allows you to play console games on any internet-enabled device. So what that looks like is you can play your cool console IP like Halo, like Little Big Planet, on non-consoles, like a PC, like a tablet, like a uh, phone. So this technology will allow you to do that in any assortment of any console game. Now, what we've got to sort out is what will be the assortment, how will you take it to market, and our biggest idea right now is a try-before-you-buy service. So we've announced that in the spring of 2012, we will have a try-before-you-buy service we're going to call Test Drive. And the way this will look is you'll look on our website and you'll see us offering new games, pre-owned games, and a try-before-you-buy version of a game, which means that you'll have a play now button which will allow you to play a game for an hour, for two hours, for a certain amount that we will negotiate with our publishers. At the end of that time, that game will stream to your PC or your tablet. At the end of that time, we will offer you the opportunity to, do you want to play more for another subscription? Do you want to buy it from GameStop.com? And we'll let you stream it until the game shows up. Or do you want to go to one of our stores and pick up the game now? So the streaming world is an interesting one. You've seen what happens with video, and you've seen what happens with music. Video gaming is different. There's latency challenges that you face. There's bandwidth challenges. But the world of video game streaming will be upon us. And there are many competitors in this space. There are other companies in it. We believe our solution is a unique console-friendly solution that reinforces console IP. And we can talk about that during the Q&A session if somebody wants to get into it. Game Informer is our magazine. We have over 6 million subscribers in the United States. It's uh, the number four biggest magazine in the U.S. We're bigger than Oprah, bigger than Newsweek. Uh, I've learned at being at GameStop. I never thought at Tech I'd be in the publishing business, by the way. We don't do a lot of publishing here, but we're the number four magazine. Uh, we also have the largest digital magazine in the United States. If any of you are Power Up Rewards members, you may be receiving 
the digital magazine on your tablets or on your laptops. Very interesting growth area with a lot of people adding on a monthly basis. We launched tablets, we announced uh, uh, this week, and um, I was in a bunch of our stores today that are selling tablets. We've got two tablet stores in Atlanta. One's at the Prado Center on Roswell Road. The other is at Lenox. And uh, the tablets business is a very interesting business. You may have read that the tablet forecasts are to really grow in the United States. There's over 300 SKUs of tablet products coming to market for holiday. Um, we believe it's a crowded space, and our secret weapon to this is We've been very selective and tested as many tablets as we could get our hands on to find the best tablets for gaming. We're calling them gaming certified tablets, and we've got three Android operating system tablets that we'll be launching. Those tablets will come with about $100 worth of free games. They're also available with a controller. The consumer work told us that the controller is the key barrier to immersive gaming on a tablet. And if you think about that, if you're used to playing Little Big Planet or Super Mario, and we're now asking you to play it by tapping a tablet. For a lot of consumers, that's not a great experience. So we have created a proprietary controller with its own software development kit in our factory that we will merchandise to consumers as a test, really as R&D, to see how immersive gaming develops. So you'll see that in our stores. Feel free to go to Linux and take a look. The Congregate Arcade is preloaded for casual games, and we think this is a big area. So very interesting and exciting stuff. Um, at this point, I'm going to pause and say that this is all interesting stuff, but it's not all technology and it's not all digital strategy at GameStop. There's also a lot of fun. So in my job, one of the interesting things is I get to be involved in marketing. So I'm going to play for you some exclusive uh, marketing elements that we have teed up for holiday. And uh, now these have never been seen anywhere before. I think one of them has been public. The other are private. I'm going to trust that all of you will not take them to my competitors. Do I have everybody's commitment to that? Don't show these to our competitors, but these are three, these are three or four ads that you'll see playing at Holiday. Don't know. Let's go to the let's go to the second one. Any Batman anybody Batman fans out there? like that one. Oh, that one already. This one should be the bunny. There it is right there. Yeah. Anybody familiar with the GameStop bunny? Last one should be the Assassin's Creed. There it is right there, yeah. So, you know, what you're trying to do when you're a category specialist like we are, you're trying to be different. You're trying to be closer to the gamer than what our competitors might be. So that's kind of an example of the marketing elements that we do. And if we had time, I'd show you a lot of funny stuff that we try to do. But 
the idea here is to be different in your marketing and to be unique and to be closer to that gaming consumer. So, lessons for the future. This is where I get to, uh, to give you my point of view on the kind of things that I would encourage you to think about as you get ready for the future. The first is that luck is when preparation meets opportunity. I said before that you're here to be prepared and you're here to, to learn. And I have seen that luck is really when preparation meets opportunity. Many times you will encounter an opportunity that if you're not prepared for, just kind of moves away from you. And those are, those are professional opportunities, business opportunities of all kinds. If you have a broad skill set, if you've invested in yourself, if you understand that uh, international opportunities could become important. If you've invested in learning about, you know, any area that maybe you're weak in, invest in yourself, prepare yourself because opportunities will come along and if you're not ready for them, then you're going to say, well, I'm just not lucky. It's not really luck because luck is when preparation meets opportunity. Think about the people you know who have had success professionally or always seem to be falling into opportunities. Frequently, I will tell you, they're people who are prepared. So being prepared is the best way to be lucky in a professional setting. And I would encourage you to think about that and to think broadly about your preparation. Every job has dignity and purpose. You know, some of you may be approaching graduation. Some of you may be far from it. Some of you may be grad students. But you know, every job has dignity and purpose. And what I've learned is that no matter how trivial it may seem, no matter how insignificant the assignment, everything has dignity and purpose. And if you do it well, you will find you'll get bigger opportunities. And if you're bigger than your job, your job will get bigger. And I see this playing out all the time. It's played out in my own career. Seize the moment on every single assignment you're given. Turn it into the biggest thing that you could possibly think of. You know, give yourself a pep talk every day around what you're doing. Whether that's, you know, you may go to a company that they let you, they give you the, you know, the, the QA testing for the POS app, you know, something simple. They may ask you to, you know, prepare a document. They may ask you to do some basic accounts reconciliation, things that may seem trivial to you, take those on as an enormous project. Pretend that you're in, uh, you know, you're, de you're trying to design a spaceship to the moon. Do an outstanding job with it, and I think you'll find that your job will get bigger. I see this too often, that people are expecting the big assignment right out of school, the big opportunity, but they're all big opportunities. You just haven't noticed them for what they are yet. You haven't understood the gravity of what they've asked you to do. So every job has dignity and purpose. Create a reputation for excellence. I can't say enough to, to our associates in our business how important it is to create a reputation for excellence, no matter what you do. And you'll find that if you do this, you will never have to ask for a bigger opportunity because people will say, oh, so-and-so, the last time we gave them an assignment, boy, they did a great job. Or, boy, that was a really well-done presentation they did. Or, oh, they really researched that well. Seize the moment and create a reputation for excellence, and that will carry you the rest of the way. You're starting from a great place. As Georgia Tech graduates, you will carry the imprimatur of the institute, which means you will have a seal on you that you can't see and you may not recognize, but that seal says a Georgia Tech graduate, you have a reputation for excellence. So your job is to enhance that every day in every way that you can. Make people around you successful. You know, many, many times I talk to groups, college groups, uh, young groups, young executives, diversity groups, Hispanic groups, et cetera, and I always hear the same thing, Paul, how do I, what do I need to do to position myself to be a CEO or a senior executive or a CFO or a, or a tenured person in a company? And, you know, what I say is don't focus so much on your own success. Make people around you successful. If you're part of a team, figure out a way for that team to win. If you're part of, a, of an organization, figure out how you make the weak links in that organization better. Because what you'll find is if you make other people successful, they will make you successful. And I think that that's often lost in today's world where everyone is, everyone is sort of focused on the, the CNBC moment in the limelight where it's all about the individual. You know, not to, uh, my team always tells me don't use so many sports analogies because that's not exactly female friendly. So I try, to, I try to broaden, I use theater analogies. You know, if you're a member of a Broadway show, right? If you're a, but look at Georgia Tech football, right? On any given play, we have three to four people downfield blocking. Those aren't glamorous assignments, right? The glamorous assignment is carrying the ball. But I've gotten to where I spend more time looking for Roddy Jones to hit somebody downfield because that gets me excited. Or to see Stephen Hill tie somebody up, that's kind of funny because you go, everybody else is trying to be the superstar and these guys are part of a team. Make people around you successful. Think about that and focus on that. 
Build relationships. I can't tell you how important relationships are. I mean, there's no language to describe how important relationships are. I mean, I'm here today because I have a relationship with Georgia Tech that spans many years. Uh, I've spent a lot of time knowing people here, and I've built relationships. I've never looked for a job. Every job I've ever taken has been because someone in a previous job asked me to come join them on this new job. You know, relationships are important. And you may think some relationships are more important than others. What I see happens is people don't cultivate and invest in relationships. Maintain relationships. In a world today where all of you have email, all of you have, I'm guessing, access to computers, laptops, Twitter accounts, Facebook, it's a shame if you can't maintain a relationship. I mean, it's a real pity. And in your world, you have global relationships. You're communicating with people around the world all the time. Build those relationships over time, and you'll find that those relationships will come back to you over and over and over again. Invite yourself to the party. This is an important one. You know, I see people, and I was this way when I was here. I used to sort of take a good soldier mentality. Like, uh, you know, I'm here to sort of stand by and wait for an assignment. You know, I'm standing by, right? I'm ready for the assignment, you know? <laughs> That's OK, but if you want to be successful, I think you have to invite yourself to the party. You all have started doing that because you chose, I'm assuming you chose here to come as volunteers. Maybe some professor made it mandatory. I doubt it. You probably came as a volunteer. That's inviting yourself to the party. You want to learn. You want to broaden yourself. You want to, right? Invite yourself to the party. Part of, part of, part of being successful in a business and in a future world filled with technology, filled with, with disruption, right? Filled with international challenges is to invite yourself to the party. If there's an area you're uncomfortable with, go learn about it. Just go step right into it and say, I'm here to invite. Paul said I have to invite myself to the party, so I'm here. You know? Don't be afraid of that, because that's how personal growth happens. La ventana y el espejo. Where's my, my Spanish scholar? What does la ventana y el espejo mean? The window and the mirror? I have some more Spanish scholars. OK. Why do I talk about the window and the mirror? Um, if anybody read Good to Great, which is a great book, um, there is some de behavior described in that book about great, the behavior of great companies. And there's all kinds of incredible content in that book. But one of the things that always stuck with me is that great leaders behave in the way of a window and a mirror. And there's all kinds of stuff bad leaders do that they talk about. But let's talk about what great leaders do. When great leaders see success happening, they're looking out the window and thanking their team and rewarding their team and complimenting the team. I've got a great team. They've done a great job. Boy, did they position us well. Boy, did they execute the business plan. Wow, was that a great forecast, giving the team credit. And when times are tough, what great leaders are doing is looking in the mirror. What can I do personally today to be successful? Yeah, that professor is tough. Yeah, uh, that was an unfair test. Yeah, the curve was tough. In a business, you know, yeah, the forecast was aggressive. Yeah, the weather was bad. But what am I going to do? What am I going to do personally? Because it's easy to look around and blame other people. I will tell you, life's filled with adversity. There's plenty of people to blame, OK? You know, if I don't make my sales plan, if I don't make my earnings targets, if my shares decline on the public exchange, there's plenty of people I can blame. Unfortunately, that doesn't get you very far. So what you've got to do is look in that mirror every day. What am I going to do today to make this different? If I'm not performing well, what am I going to do about it? Because candidly, that's the only person who can make a difference is you individually. So think about that as you go forward. And I will tell you that in parting, before we do Q&A, I just want to reinforce that we got to go out and beat Virginia Tech next week, right? I mean, that's, that's vital to us. So with that, with that, I'll open it up to Q&A. I think we have some time for questions and answers. Georgia Tech, Atlanta, we're losing an awful lot of talent to Austin, Is Texas. Is that right? Um, primarily because it's perceived as, I don't know, keep Austin weird. Yeah. It has this kind of eclectic yep. Yep. perception. What does Atlanta have to do? What does Georgia Tech have to do to keep our talent here and attract a lot more of the game developers, yep. data yep. center business, innovative design people, R&D people? Absolutely, great question. You know, um, that's a great question. Atlanta, as a destination for technology development, had some great years. If you think about Atlanta, I've seen some public data from the 80s all the way through the Norcross technology sector. All of that was really tremendous growth. What I see happening today 
in the aggressive places, and Austin's not the only one, by the way. Go look at what the state of Louisiana is doing. I mean, I've got a guy from the state of Louisiana in my office once a month. We don't do a ton of development. We don't, you know, but we do some, and we partner with people like Electronic Arts, who just opened a studio in Baton Rouge. Now, how can a studio open in Baton Rouge when here we are in beautiful, multicultural, high-tech Atlanta, right? I think we need to start with the state, and the state needs to help us with some development around technology. The state has some incentives. Uh, I'm not real familiar with them, but I'm familiar with some. I think government plays a role here. As far as Georgia Tech, I think Georgia Tech plays a huge role in leading this state into a technology field. I mean, with using Georgia Tech as seed capital for growth and promotion is a big deal. In some ways, I think we're promoting Georgia better internationally than we are nationally. You know, I, I see Georgia Tech as a destination internationally, but I deal, I was at Microsoft Friday, I was at EA Wednesday, I was at Sony Thursday. You know, these people have huge development budgets that are going somewhere. And California is not the destination it was. So I, I, I agree with you that we're at risk. And it's not just Austin. Baton Rouge is a place. Boston is a place I hear a lot about. But I think we need to make some concerted pushes. And I don't have a, a lot of good ideas for you other than that. But I would love to help on that if anybody at, in Georgia is working on that. So. Yes. I'm, uh, I'm Rahul Reddy. I'm a fourth year industrial engineer. Hey, Rahul. Hey, uh, I Great was wondering um, how globalization affects you know, physical retail stores. And I guess more specifically, GameStop, how uh, that's changing it? Yep, yep. Uh, globalization and retail stores. I think, you know, the thing about globalization that's interesting is I'm in an entertainment business. You know, I'm kind of in a, it's a funny business because I'm kind of in a, it's entertainment crossed with technology, but we just happen to operate all these stores and, and platforms. So uh, I think the one thing about globalization that strikes me is the dominance of American culture in entertainment. If you go around the world, with, with many exceptions, of course, but if you go to Europe, Australia, Canada, where I operate in, American popular culture is dominating those markets. Everywhere I go, it's American intellectual property, US-based, you know? And so that means that the timing and chronology of it is really driven out of the US, and even tighter, the West Coast of the United States is where a lot of that's happening. So I think the one piece about globalization is, to me, it forces us to be better at integration and, and chronology. We have to, we can't launch a title in the US and then six months later launch it in Australia because the way the networks are in globalization, it's happening instantly. So the one piece is timing and chronology is getting faster and more important that it be synchronized. The second piece is there are enormous markets like India and China where US based retailers are non existent. And, and I will tell you that's not because we don't have an interest, it's because we haven't cracked the code on how to enter those markets. So I think the two sides of globalization are we see strong dominance of American entertainment culture. Certainly video game publishing is based here. But we also have enormous markets where other players are entering and moving at a faster rate. And I would submit China, the, uh, maybe some of you are from China, the, the penetration of MMORPG games, China-based publishers you know, uh, are like Shanda and, and uh, Tencent. These guys are driving incredible growth that US companies are not participating in. And I think that's a problem for us competitiveness-wise. And we're trying to address it, so. Hi, how are you doing? My name is Namori Keita. I'm a grad student in chemical engineering. Great. So my question is about uh, games that are educational. So do you have any games that will teach math, science to pre-K or middle school or even Georgia Tech students who want to learn, but in a fun way? Uh, we don't have anything for Georgia Tech students. Y'all are pretty advanced, so uh, you, might, you might raise the bar on what we offer. We do offer in the handheld space, Nintendo DS and PSP, we do offer a lot of educational games. It's interesting. There's educational games that we have not, we're not a huge player in, but we do have some. Uh, the LeapFrog platform has been an important one. We don't carry it. You'll see that at Target and Walmart that has a lot more education in it. Um, we also have educational games for seniors. It's interesting, there's a lot of games out there for seniors to stay sharp, and we deal with a lot of seniors coming into our stores buying a lot of these math-based reasoning games. So I'd say we participate on the handheld side with younger kids and with seniors, but the real sweet spot of that business is probably a different platform from the one we carry. It's an interesting business. GameStop started out as an educational software company. Some of you may know, uh, if you remember, if you're, I don't know if anyone's old enough, there was a company called Software Etc., which was a really a hardcore software, educational software. There's a company called Babbage's. Both those companies combined to become GameStop. And we still have some Babbage's and software, et cetera, is out there carrying some of those additional SKUs. So. Hey, 
Hey, my name is Jeremy Craig. I'm a fourth year. Yeah, where are you at, Jeremy? Oh, there you are. Right here. Sorry. Um, I'm a fourth year management major, and uh, I was wondering, is GameStop worried that with all the advances in technology, especially with like what you're talking about, like the cloud and the free try and everything streaming, the GameStop stores might, like the in-store locations might actually become obsolete? Yeah, of course. That's a great question. Um, you know, the real estate footprint is a massive question. There was a, does anybody follow retail analysts? I mean, if you read some of the retail analyst work, Morgan Stanley had a very famous piece uh, that said two years ago that retail in the United States is overstored and under demolished, right? Which is two bad things, you know, overstored, under demolished. Neither one of those is good. Uh, you see people like uh, Best Buy coming out and talking about a reduced store footprint. You see people like a Home Depot slowed down very significantly. What GameStop has done is we, number one, we have a very flexible real estate portfolio. We renew about 25% of our portfolio every year, which means if we wanted to, we could close one out of four stores every year, which we don't want to, but that's a very flexible portfolio. The other side of that equation is we have announced in the United States that we would have net zero square footage growth. And the reason for that is we're doing a much better job of transferring our business through Power Up Rewards. You know, I mentioned 14 million people represent 30% of all video game consumption. We are able to close stores. We just closed a store in Chastain, near Chastain Park, and transferred it to Prado. We can close a store and transfer 40 to 60% of the traffic of that store directly to another store through online marketing, which will yield a 20 to 30% increase in profit contribution of the combined store base. So our strategy is that one. At the same time, video gaming is far more, is far less digitally focused today than music or streaming or any of the movie stuff. So we also have to match the chronology of the consumer. And I like to tell analysts that while you're investing in us as a technology company, you also have to recognize we are a chronology company. Part of the value creation we bring is understanding how many consumers want to buy a physical game, how many consumers want to buy a digital game. So we're trying to match that. So yeah, it's top of mind for us, and you'll see in our public announcements a lot of discussion around real estate. But we're very comfortable with the strength and viability of the portfolio, and the returns candidly continue to be extraordinary of GameStop stores. So uh, for now, we're in great shape. Hi, Mr. Reins. My name is Jessica, and I'm a second year master's student in AE. And I just have a question. Um, I know you mentioned the importance of relationships on helping you get to where you are today. And I also noticed that you have a diverse portfolio of different retailers and geographical locations. Has it just been the relationships that you've had that have helped you with these transitions, or have there been other factors? Uh, it's a great question. Je Jessica asked me this earlier uh, about I'm on the board of a company called Advance Auto Parts. So I'll tell you all a story about that. Advanced Auto Parts, it's about a $6 billion uh, revenue, Fortune 300-ish, 400-ish company that sells uh, auto parts. Big footprint in Atlanta. The CEO of Advanced Auto Parts is an extraordinary CEO, one of the top guys in retail today. His name is Darren Jackson. Darren used to be the CFO of Best Buy for many years. Well, when I was at the Home Depot, we spent a lot of time together. We'd do benchmarking and, you know, We'd visit his stores, they'd visit ours, and Darren and I got to know each other. Well, when Darren went to Advance Auto Parts, he called me up and said, would you like to join our board? So people think that the world revolves around very complex search processes and, and uh, you know, uh, very uh, extremely uh, complex filtration of, of who the candidates are, and that all happens, and that's all true. But relationships are enormous, and I think, for me, it's always been about relationships, and, you know, I, I don't expect it'll be any different for any of you. Life's all about building relationships. Now, it doesn't do you any good to have a relationship if your reputation is not for excellence, right? Because then the opposite happens. People avoid you and your relationships are terrible. So, but if you build a reputation for excellence, which I think all of you will, you'll find that your relationships are a key part of the future. A few data points you may not be aware of. I have 2010 data. I don't have 11. It should be close. Something like 16% of titles are M-rated. So it's not the majority of titles that are mature rated. Second point is um, video gaming is very similar to movies and TV content. It's an entertainment medium that has different kinds of uh, entertainment for different audiences, adult, children, et cetera. The third point is there's an ESRB group, the Entertainment Software Ratings Board, that manages the ratings of games. There's people in Washington. They rate every single game that's out there. And uh, that's what creates the E, E10, T, and M ratings in the United States. In Europe, it's a group called PEGI. 
But we are one of the founding members of that ratings agency, and we are by far the highest complying retailer. Our compliance on ESRB execution in store is about 96% last month, which means 96% of the time someone gets sold a game that they are the appropriate age level for. So my response to that as a father with two kids, one who's 17, one who's 13, is that I'm very comfortable with GameStop's execution of what is probably the best ratings execution in the entertainment industry. So uh, I don't think you're going to see mature rated games go away. You know, games about warfare, games about crime, those kinds of things are going to continue. And, uh, and I think what's important is understanding that there's different kinds of entertainment for different audiences and don't sell games to people who aren't supposed to be playing them. I tell parent groups all the time, your child should not be playing an M-rated game if they're not 17 or 18. You know, there's no reason that you need to be playing uh, Call of Duty online if you're an eight-year-old. And we don't support that for sure. So we don't expect anyone to, to do that. So I think, I think it's important to understand that. And, and, uh, and I think the industry has done a pretty good job of self-policing. I would compare us to the movie industry and say we're way ahead. So that's kind of my response to that. Yes, sir. My Costa Rican here, man. You get extra time. <laughs> uh, pura vida. Uh, yeah, there you go. My name's uh, Otto Mora. Um, I, I think that, you know, it's all, we all share the same concern, you know, of uh, kind of the bits versus atoms things that's going on, right? Yep. Um, and uh, it seems like the cloud kind of heightens the importance of uh, horizontal integration a little bit. And I think one of the great players uh, to do that is Apple, right? So with their stores, you know, I think, you know, certain things that perhaps you could consider, uh, you know, the guru bar, you know, being one thing, one element, uh, perhaps uh, a little bit of another social element, uh, kind of the Starbucks model, you know, stay and play, that kind of thing. Are you guys taking any of those kind of retail innovations and, and putting them into your model a little bit? Is that part of kind of the, the transformation? Yeah, yeah, I think those are good points. I mean, if you think about the guru bar at Apple, I mean, everybody loves Apple, right? Apple's an extraordinary company. But remember that Apple is a device company not really a software company as much as they are a device company. They're selling lots of software on the apps. As far as the Guru Bar, we, we are investing heavily in associate knowledge. And in fact, we might argue our entire store is the Guru Bar. If you go shop a GameStop, and I hope, I hope some of you will. I'm not up here trying to shill for GameStop, but I really am. But, uh, <laughs> but you do have a GameStop right here. Go to a GameStop and compare the knowledge level of the associate. If you tell our associate, our associates, we spend, our HR team is here today, and uh, they spend a lot of time training and developing the skills of our associates to know, hey, I like FIFA sports games. Oh, okay, did you know there's a Pro Evolution soccer game that's got some different teams? Did you know there's a Facebook version of FIFA? We spend a lot of time with gamers explaining. Moms or dads will come in and say, you know, that Call of Duty is too violent, to your question. I really don't like it. Is there something else my, my son would like? Well, we've got this T-rated Uncharted, which is pretty cool, but far less violent, et cetera. So we spend a lot of time training. We invest. It's one of the reasons you see our market share be superior to the competition. So number one is we, we absolutely support education of associates. Now, physically changing our store footprint is a different matter, because these are 1,500 square foot stores. Uh, this one's a little bigger, but generally our average is about 1,500 square feet with an installed base of 6,200. So changing that is rough. So we are constantly experimenting, and we'd like to do some things. You see this store has two registers, for example. The concept is one of those becomes a trade register and a consultation, and the other is the retail register. We try to do some of that stuff. We also believe in play in our stores. If you look at the interactives we have down here, they're a lot newer than what we have up at Howell Mill, for example. And we believe that we should have more play in store. The challenge you face for us is, for example, midnight launch. If you look at what we do with midnight launches, uh, Monday night, next Monday night, we will have, uh, I can't see what can I disclose, what can I not disclose. <laughs> we will have probably 4,600 stores open at midnight with hundreds of people in line, pizza parties, playing Call of Duty, et cetera. Red, and that's what we think works, you know? So yes, I think you're right, and we follow Apple closely, and we spend a lot of time. By the way, the Apple conversation is an interesting one. We sell new Apple products in Australia and France, and we also now take trades on Apple devices in the United States, which is an interesting model, because we have a high-tech facility, a factory in uh, Grapevine, Texas, 200,000 square feet, where we refurbish PS3s and Xboxes. I mean, we literally do some interesting stuff. We float solder points, we reassemble graphics cards. We do lots of interesting stuff. Um, what we've learned is that 
phones and pads and tablets are easier to refurbish than a PS3 or an Xbox from a technology point of view. So we're also getting involved in that tablet space with them. But I think it's a great point. And, and we're all chasing them on the in-store experience. I was at Linux today, and Microsoft has a store. Looks just like an Apple store, right? <laughs> so, so everybody's chasing these guys, and I think it's, it's, really, a, it's really a great model. But, but, but the thing about retail is don't forget you have to invest in the headspace of the associate as much as you do in the physical furniture and, and that sort of thing. So that's where we're trying to invest. Okay, there you go. Hi, my name is Javon Lawrence. I'm a third hey, year industrial engineering major. All right. Um, just want to, first of all, thank you for coming out because I've been an avid gamer since I was a kid. Where are you from, Javon? Um, originally Chicago, but I live in Ackworth. So, Ackworth, great. Yeah. So okay. I, my store on Barrett Parkway. Yeah. Got to give rep all to right. my guys over there. Good man. Um, as an engineer with a background, well, well, industrial engineering background um, and a gaming background as well, I was trying to find out from an opportunity standpoint where GameStop is growing that could um, basically advertise to tech students and say, hey, this is something that you'd be interested in going into. Does GameStop have opportunities and things of that nature that we could go towards? Absolutely. It's your lucky day, Javon, because where's Chuck? Chuck Smith. Wave your hand, Chuck. Chuck's our vice president of HR. He's here with us today. By the way, he's, he's a Georgia fan, but we love him anyway. Right, Chuck? <laughs> he's my favorite Georgia fan. Uh, but Chuck's here. One of the things you'll see us do is we're becoming very much a technology company. And I think if you think about our PC download and our streaming businesses, that's where we're pouring capital. I mean, if you, were, if you had some Wall Street analysts in here, they would be challenging me on how much capital are you pouring into these platforms before we see a return, you know? We're putting a lot of money into the technology platforms. Last year, just to give you all an example of what the world looks like, our CapEx as a company, capital expenditures as a company, approaches $200 million a year. Last year, our store CapEx declined 17%. Our technology CapEx since 2008 is probably up, what did I say at the budget meeting the other day? It's probably up 70%, something like that, in three years. So, so the world, by the way, not just GameStop, the world is moving towards an investment level in technology that all, it, will, it will involve all of us, all majors, chemical engineering, civils, IEs, all of us will be touched by this massive capex flowing into technology. So your job, when I said preparation meets opportunity, you know, your job is to prepare yourself for a world where technology intertwines everything you do. So what's my, my, my example? I spend a lot of time reading blogs. I go to technology conferences. It's not just about, when I was here at Tech, it was about, I took my, I was an IE and I took those two double E's for non double E's, right? Shocks for jocks, I forgot what they were, V equals IR, and you know, it was two or three things, and that was all I got out of it. But, but today, your world is different. You need to understand all of the pieces of information technology, and I would encourage all of you. So, GameStop has opportunities. Chuck, we'll get Chuck to talk to you a little bit about how to communicate with us. We've got a portal and so forth. But I would just encourage all of you to think about the technology space, even if you don't want to be in technology. The realization is all of us are in technology, whether we like it or not. I see Jim Kranzik here with his iPad. You got you to gotta roll with the technology, man. There's nowhere, right? Costa Rica, my nieces and nephews, all of them are involved in all kinds of technology things in Costa Rica, small country in Central America. Many of you are from India, right? We talked about Chennai. Chennai is exploding. With, so just prepare yourselves that the world you're in is a world filled with technology, and you got to be prepared for it. Long answer to a smart question. Sorry. Yes, sir. Hi. I'm Paolo. Thank you to be Paolo? here. Um, Where I've are you from, Paolo? I'm from Italy. Italy. What part of Italy? Rome. Roma. You know we have stores in Italy, right? Yeah, I know. Yeah, all right. <laughs> it's, uh, we we We're play big. a lot. I just came back from your... I was in Sardinia for the, our Italian show. It's beautiful. Um, anyway, sorry. So, <laughs> my... I read an, an article uh, recently that was talking about the um, intention of the software house to uh, try to fight the um, market of used games. Mm -hmm. And I was wondering, what's the GameStop position about that? Yeah, yeah. Well, you know, you have to be careful with, um, with that term software house. You know, if you think about video gaming, the way the profit pools work in video gaming, there's a developer, which is a group of people who make a game, who are the creative minds behind it. Then there's a publisher who actually takes that game, refines it, prepares it, presses it, makes retail distribution arrangements, and sells it. Then there's the retailer. And then sometimes there's an online retailer like an Amazon or a GameStop.com. So when you think about our used business, a lot of the, 
of the noise you hear around the used business is developers who say used games cannibalize the new game. You rarely hear that from, you don't hear that as much from publishers as you do from developers. And the reason is developers are further from the consumer. Publishers are close to the consumer and they sort of understand consumer trends. But we have a used business that's a very significant part of our profitability. The average price point of a used video game is $18. The average price point of a new video game is $59. The percent of used games that we sell that are older or newer than 60 days is less than 4%. So what really happens in the used video game business is you're selling to a consumer who can't afford a new game. So who played Uncharted? Anybody played Uncharted this week? You played Uncharted? Cool, right? Awesome game. Sony game. Came out Monday night or Tuesday, really. Not a lot of midnights Monday night. That's a game where a lot of consumers don't have $59. So what they do is they want to go play the last year's version, and they'll play it for 18, 19, 22 bucks. So the first answer is the used games don't cannibalize the new game. The flip side is the used games created $1 billion of trade credits last year. In other words, the games we buy back from consumers is a billion dollars around the world. 70% of that billion goes immediately into, in the same transaction, a new game. So when you look at software sales, 14% of software sales are driven by used games. Less than 4% are driven by, old, by uh, less than 4% are cannibalizing new games. So the balance, it's made the industry bigger. And that's why you see our market share grow. So uh, as far as intentions to, to eliminate the used business, there's always initiatives out there, single use codes. What we've learned and what we've told people is the market for video gaming keeps growing and expanding. So it's okay. We're all about video games. If you want to make video games richer with single use codes, go ahead. We'd like to sell those codes in store. We think we can do that. But we don't see it as a real threat. So. Much for your time today. We do appreciate you. Thank you.